know it's been a blessing to my life. So today as we conclude our series on faithfulness, I want to talk about faithfulness in our trials. And trials are problems, hardships, difficulties that we all go through, all of us go through. So I want to talk about faithfulness in our trials and why you should think twice the next time you're tempted to avoid facing a hardship. Now, as we talk about faithfulness in our trials, I, I want you to just think about this for a moment. I want you to reflect on this question. What is your response when facing a difficulty? What is your response when facing a hardship? What is your response when facing a trial that God doesn't move out of your way? What is your behavior like in those situations? What type of actions do you take in those difficult moments? What is your attitude toward God and those around you? Does your integrity stay intact? Do you remain faithful, believing, knowing that God will see you through? Or are you quick to waver in your faith? Do you, do you seek solutions at all costs, even if they mean dishonoring God? And do you give up on your faithfulness to God because you felt that God gave up on his faithfulness to you? Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, help us to understand your word, and help us to put this into practice in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So by now, by now, I think we all have come to the conclusion, I think we all know that hardships, trials, difficulty, setbacks are something this world is guaranteed to bring us. Now there are times, and these are good times, there are times where God removes the difficulty out of our way and we don't have to face it. He removes the trial out of our way and we don't have to go through, through that. And I think that that's what many of us, if not all of us, pray for and prefer, not having to go through a hardship. And some of you good people here over the years, in fact, have asked for prayer for such an outcome. You've come to me personally, you've said, Pastor, I have to face the judge next week. Pray that they dismiss the case against me. You've said, Pastor, the doctor wants to run more tests. Pray that they find nothing. Pastor, um, there's a situation that unfolded at my job. Pray that I get to keep it. Pastor, things happened in my family with my kids. Pray that it doesn't get out of control. And by the grace of God, the judge dismissed your case. By the grace of God, the test came back and they found nothing. By the grace of God, you went to work, all went well, you kept your job. By the grace of God, the thing with your child or, or, or that family member ended. And God is good and we celebrate. And those are moments that I think all of us want. We want to be delivered from having to go through situations, difficulties, setbacks. But the reality is that everyone, Christian, non-Christian, old, young, rich, poor, uh, married, or single and ready to Christian mingle, whoever you are, we will all face difficulties no matter how much we pray we don't you see God's people having to face trials in their lives is a recurring theme in the Old Testament in the New Testament and in our world today in fact in the Old Testament this is what the Lord declared to his people in Isaiah 43 verse 2 the Lord says when you Go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. And notice that the Lord said, when you go through, not if you go through. 
And then in the New Testament, Jesus made it crystal clear, left nothing to the imagination. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he says this, here on earth, you will have, not might have, but will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. You see, we're guaranteed, guaranteed two things based off of these two verses. The first thing that is guaranteed to us is this. Number one, that we will all go through difficulties. And how many of you are a witness to this? In fact, today, some of you find yourself in the middle of the fire of oppression. Some of you today find yourself in rivers of difficulty. You are in the middle of deep waters of hardship. And my heart goes out to you because it's not easy or fun to go through these types of situations in our lives. And then some of you just finished getting out of a hardship. You just finished getting out of a hard situation in your life. And then still others of you, you're sitting here and you have no idea that a trial is headed directly your way. How do we know this? Because we're guaranteed that we will go through hardships, difficulties, setbacks. But we're also guaranteed something else according to these two verses. We're also guaranteed this, number two, that our God, my God, your God, the one you've entrusted your faith to, the one you've placed your faith in, that our God will be with us through them all. And how many of you are witnesses to this? See, you prayed, some of you prayed that you wouldn't go through it and you had to go through it anyway. You went through it. And it was scary, and it was exhausting, and it was frustrating, and it was challenging. But God was with you every step of the way. The difficulty did not consume you. The hardship didn't drown you. And the trial did not burn up your entire life. And you are still here today by the grace of Almighty God. And so, yes, while it is true that we will all face difficulties, no matter how much we pray them away, while it is true that we will all face difficulties, it is also true, and this is where we have to separate Christians from non-Christians. See, we all go through, Christian or non-Christian, we all go through trials, but this is where the separation happens. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you are in Christ, if you have placed your faith in him, then the second guarantee for your life is that God will be with you through them all. But if you don't have God in your life, you're going to go through it, but you're going through it alone. When I first became a follower of Jesus, I used to wonder why a lot, but especially in the areas of difficulty. I used to wonder, why doesn't God just stop all of the negativity from reaching the lives of his people? If he really cares about us. And why is it that God will spare me from having to face certain things, but then other times I have to go through them? And why do I have to go through these types of things in my life? And perhaps you're here today or you're watching and you're asking why. Why am I having to go through this? Why is it that I have to be the one to face this? Why has God spared me from other things and yet this situation he has not spared me from? We can speculate. We can take educated guesses based on biblical examples that were given. But I'll be honest, the truth is that we won't always know why. But my question to you, Jesus follower, is this. Does knowing the why make a difference to the quality of your faithfulness demonstrated to God? 
Would knowing the why change your faithfulness to him? Does it make a difference if you know why you're going through the things you're going through? And our lead pastor, Pastor David, has said this time and time and time again from here, from behind the pulpit. He said that our goal as Jesus followers is not to figure out why. It is to trust God and be faithful to him. I'm reminded of a man named Job in the Bible, and uh, Job is described to be a, a man who was blameless before God and full of integrity. I mean, he is the, the model of what faithfulness should look like in the life of a person. And we're not going to read the entire book of Job. It's long, but I encourage you, if you've never read it, read it. It will change your life. It will speak to your heart. It will encourage you, and it will challenge you. But we're told in the book of Job that one day the devil goes before God and he accuses Job before God. And he says this, do you know why he's faithful to you? He's faithful to you because he's been so blessed and so protected from you. And maybe that's what the devil has accused you of before God. Do you know why she comes to church? Do you know why he comes to church? Do you know why he gives? Do you know why she gives? Do you know why they serve? Because they have all this stuff. Because you've blessed them. But he says this, take that away from Job and watch him lose his faithfulness too. And the Lord gives him permission. He says, take it, but don't touch him. Now, I want you to understand this, the backdrop of it all. Job has no idea what is even happening. He is just living his life the way you are living your life today. And then, shortly after that conversation, we're told that the devil, he, he attacks Job's wealth. He attacks Job's help, the servants. He attacks Job's livestock, and he attacks Job's children. And almost at an instant, he loses it all. And Job had no idea why he's facing these trials. And yet we're told in Job chapter 1 verse 22 that in all of this, and I want to pause on that because sometimes we just gloss over and we don't really capture what's happening. In all of this pain, in all of this frustration in all of this difficulty in all of this agony job did not sin by blaming god what were we told about him that he remained faithful even through his trials now we're told again that the devil goes back to god and he accuses job again of uh, and he says this the reason he's faithful is because he hasn't lost his health. Take that away too and watch him lose his faithfulness. And shortly after, Job has these boils, these, these things all over his body and they were painful. And again, Job has no idea why he's facing what he's facing, and my heart goes out to Job. I can only imagine in real time, as this is playing out in his life, I can only imagine the pain and the agony that he is suffering, that he is facing, because it's painful to lose what you've worked so hard for, especially when you lose it almost instantly. And some of you don't have to imagine what that feels like because you have ha had to go through it. You have lost something you worked so hard to build almost at an instant. And you know exactly the emotions, the pain, the turmoil that comes with that. And then Job, I can only imagine the, the, having your, your good health be gone. And some of you don't even have to imagine what that feels like because you're going through it. Your good health being taken away. Test after test, medicine after medicine, study after study, treatment after treatment. You know the frustration, the pain, the fear that brings. 
And I can only imagine what it must have been like for Job to lose all of his children in an instant. But some of you don't have to imagine that feeling because you have lost a child. You have lost a son. You have lost a daughter. You have lost someone very close to you. And you know exactly what it feels like to be in those shoes. And again, Job has no idea why this is happening. But the why, the why didn't make a difference to the quality of the faithfulness he was demonstrating to God. In fact, we're told this in Job chapter 9, verse 10, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, I'm sorry. This is what he says. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? (laughs) You're still, after everything that has happened to you and us, You're still trying to be faithful to God? You're still going to church? You're still giving to God? You're still lifting your hands up? You're still doing that? She says, curse God and die. Just blame him already. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad. So in all of this pain and suffering and frustration and confusion, Job said nothing wrong. Let me ask you this, church. Are you willing Are you willing to remain faithful to God through your trials even if you don't know why you're facing them? We may not always know the why, but let me tell you, we can know the what. What does God want to do? What does God want to accomplish in his perfect will as I go through this? Okay, I wasn't spared from this, so what does God want to accomplish? And it's a twofold answer. The first thing God wants to accomplish in you is this. God wants to show you his faithfulness. And hardships are the perfect place for us to see on full display what God wants to do in our lives. Because listen, it's one thing to read about God's faithfulness and God was faithful and God was faithful. It's one thing to read about it, but it's a whole nother thing to experience it in your own life. In Mark chapter four, we're told about the disciples, how they were following Jesus at the beginning stages. They were traveling from place to place, learning about who Jesus was, and they're seeing all these amazing things take place. And then they get into the boat, and they're going to cross the Sea of Galilee to go to the other side. And then suddenly, right as they're on their way, crossing this, 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 this small lake, this, this Sea of Galilee, it says that this ferocious storm breaks out. It is so overwhelming that the waves begin to pound the boat and begin to overwhelm and flood the boat. There is a panic. Now, I can only imagine this must have been an incredible storm like anything else they had ever seen because some of the men that were following Jesus had been fishermen before. And even they were scared of this storm. They had probably seen it all. It's like, I know I'm in a bad place when I'm with some of you that are hood, and we grew up in the hood, but we're scared of this hood. We're like, this hood is really bad. If we're from the hood, and I'm scared. And they had seen all of it, and yet they're frightened. And they go to Jesus, and and we're told this detail that Jesus is sleeping on a cushion in the back of a boat. And they go and they wake him up, teacher, teacher, wake up. And they ask him this powerful question, don't you care if we drown? And when have you felt like the disciples? 
that you feel like Jesus is, is checked out of your situation, asleep in your situation, away from your situation, or that he simply doesn't care the pain and the suffering and the hardship that you're going through. I know I have. There's been times where I can't help but wonder, God, where are you? When are you going to show up? This is getting harder and harder by the day. This is getting harder and harder by the minute. Verse 39 in Mark chapter 4 tells us that when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves. And this is what he said, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm and then he turns to them and he asks them why are you afraid do you still have no faith and I love this part I laugh at this part this next part it says that the disciples were absolutely terrified they went from being terrified of the storm to being absolutely terrified of Jesus because they asked each other, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. Now follow me with this. If they wouldn't have gone through the storm that day, it would have been just another boat ride for them. But that day, having gone through a storm unlike anything they'd ever seen, allowed them to see something so necessary in their walk with God. They learned not from the prophecies about Jesus. They learned firsthand being with Jesus that they do not need to be afraid as long as they have Christ, as long as they're walking with him, as long as he's there. They don't need to be afraid of anything. Don't clap yet, because even the winds and waves obey him. Now you can clap. So some of you are new to the faith. You're new to walking with Jesus, and you have not yet come to the full conclusion that even the winds and the waves obey him. You have not yet come to the conclusion that you are the safest wherever Jesus is. You have not come to that conclusion, and God wants to show you that. God wants to show you it's worth trusting in him. That as long as he's by your side, you don't need to be afraid of anything. Now, some of you, you're not so new, and you still haven't come to that conclusion. And that's okay. God wants you to be absolutely convinced. He wants to show you his power. He wants to show you his authority. He wants to show you his security. He wants to show you his faithfulness, and it will happen best in the middle of a storm. And the more storms you go through in life, the more of his faithfulness you will see. To the point where you will wholeheartedly believe what Paul believed in, in Philippians 4.13. Come on, some of you know it, some of you have it tatted right on your neck. For I can do everything. I can get through anything. I can face Whatever comes my way, that was the, 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 the anchor of this verse that Paul was saying, man, I have gone through it all. And you know what I have found out? That I will get through it all through Christ who gives me strength. I am not, I am not the highlight in this verse. Jesus by my side is the highlight. So we may not know why we're going through it, but we do know what. God wants to accomplish. He wants to show you his faithfulness. And the second thing he wants to do with this, which is equally as important, number two, God wants to grow your faithfulness. Come on, my faithfulness needs to grow. I'm not at the point of Job yet. In all of this, I still tend to blame God sometimes. 
In all of this, I still tend to doubt sometimes. In all of this, my, my, my faith wavers a little here and a little there. And my faithfulness needs work. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to help you out. He said, I'm going to help you out. Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul talks about this very point. He says, we can rejoice too. What are we rejoicing about? I want to rejoice when we run into problems and trials. Oh, no, no, no. Leave me out of that. That doesn't make sense. We can rejoice too. I have never in the entire time I've been here at Trinity Church, and I was 12 years old, and I sat in the nosebleeds way back there. What's up, nosebleeds? Shout out. When I was way back there, never since I've been here have I heard a person say, who wants to give a testimony? Who wants to thank the Lord for? I thank the Lord for the problems and the trials that I have in my life. So it's a little backwards. But he says, no, 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 hold on. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, and then he just gives us such incredible, incredible information. For we know, and some of you don't know, but you will know, for we know that they, the problems and the trials, help us, help you, help me develop endurance. And let me tell you about endurance. It is an ingredient that you need so that you can remain faithful. Endurance is what helps you endure whatever comes your way. Remain, persevere. And how many of you want to endure until the very end, until God calls you home? And that's what Jesus' hope is. In fact, in Revelation, he says this, remain faithful until the end and I will give you the crown of life. I want to remain until the end. And Paul says, yeah, and guess what? Problems and trials will help you do just that. And he goes on to say this, and endurance, it gets better. Endurance develops another ingredient in you, strength of character. And you know what strength of character is? It's another word to say integrity. And that's also needed for you to remain faithful. You know what integrity is? That you're the same person in church and out of church. That you have the same values in here and at your job. That you are the same person in the middle of problems and the same person in the middle of paradise. That your values don't waver or change no matter how much pressure you get around you. He says, and, and, your, and the problems and trials, that's what they'll add to you. And he says, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loved us or loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. What is he saying? Not only will our faithfulness to God strengthen through the endurance and through the integrity, the strength of character, but we will be able to stand on the confidence that our salvation, our security is found and anchored in Jesus. That's what will happen. That is what happens to the life of a believer when we face trials. When we run into situation, God uses it to better us and for us to see a better picture of God. And this will result in a more godly, in a more faithful, in a more healthy version of you. Because understand this, brother or sister, understand this. More than changing your situation, more than changing your situation, more than changing your situation, God wants to change you. That's what he's after. That's what he wants to do. 2 Corinthians chapter, two, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 reveals to us just that. Paul writes, so all of us who have had that veil removed, those that have given their life to him, those that follow him. We were blind, but now we see. Those who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the spirit, watch this, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. More than changing your situation, God wants to change you. 
I know we would much rather not go through hardship. I know. But if we were to avoid those things, we would also be avoiding us seeing on full display how faithful God is, how powerful God is, how all-knowing God is, how gracious God is, how merciful God is, how sure God is. And we would also avoid growing in our faithfulness. And I don't know about you, but I have some growing to do. I'm still not where I need to be, where I want to be, where I hope to be. But God says, that's okay. I will help you along the way. And I know you may not like this. I know you may not enjoy this. But these trials and problems, though they might look bad, though the world may send them, though the devil may attack you, I will use them for good. Now, in just a few moments, we're going to pray. I'm going to lead you where you are in two prayers. The first is this, easy. If you are going through anything, you say, Pastor, I'm going through some hard things. I just need help keeping my eyes on Jesus. I want to remain faithful. Pray for me. I will. The second thing is this. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I hope to lead you in a relationship with Jesus. Because not only will you have Jesus by your side the moment you choose to say yes to Jesus, all your sins are forgiven. Your name is written in the book of life, which means this. You have security. Even if you were to die today, tonight, tomorrow, heaven is your home. Heaven is your destination. And who wouldn't want that? But before I pray, yes, while it is true, while it is guaranteed that you will face hardships, that we will all go through them, it's also true that our God will be with them or us through them all. The same one that conquered sin, the same one that conquered death, the same one that overcame the world, and the same one that the waves and the winds obey him is the same one that is by your side. And his desire for you is that you would be faithful like Job and like Paul and like all of those other heroes of faith. His desire is that even if the devil accuses you, take her stuff away, take his stuff away. His desire is that you remain faithful through it all. That in all of this, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, if you prayed, you're here, you prayed. Maybe you have a chip on your shoulder. Your, your heart is wrestling back and forth because you want to you wanna be angry at God. And if you prayed and, and the situation didn't disappear, if you fasted, believing God would clear the way and it's still there. If you believed with all your heart and you're still having to look at the trial face to face. Instead of asking why am I going through this, ask God what do you want to, go, do, you want to do there. And allow me to see it. Allow me to see your faithfulness on full display and allow me to see me grow in faithfulness to you. Remember that the rivers of difficulties will not drown you, that the waters will not overtake you, and the fire will not consume you. And remember this, that the last words Jesus uttered before his ascension were these, his very last words. And be sure of this. And be sure of this. And be sure of of this I, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm going to ask that you